We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that you really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Modrovics. Joining me today is Mike Singleton, Senior Analyst and Founder at Invictus Research. Thanks for joining me today, Mike. Thank you for having me, Tom. Love the show. Thanks. So you are a, a business cycle investor. So what does that mean? And where are we in each of the cycles that matter to you? Okay. So we are business cycle investors at Invictus. Uh, we define the business cycle as the nominal growth cycle, which of course you can break down further into the real growth cycle and the inflation cycle. And uh, I think when you say that the economy cycles, that, that real growth cycles and that inflation cycles, um, you're saying something that's maybe a little bit counterintuitive and countercultural within the investment community. And that's that uh, the economy is predictable to some extent, right? It's not random. Mm -hmm. Um, And then also the markets, which reflect the economy are also predictable to some extent. And you can, um, you can leverage that conviction to make better investment decisions. So uh, in terms of where we are in the growth and inflation cycle, I think it's helpful to maybe zoom out and think about where we've been, because that just helps to put things in perspective. So uh, maybe we'll start in 2020 through COVID. Um, In Q2 of 2020, the world sort of stopped turning, for lack of a better word. Uh, The government governments around the world locked down economies. If you look at any economic statistic over that time period that that measures growth, obviously, they were all very, very bad. Uh, In in the US, real GDP printed negative 12.2% year over year or something like that. So uh, obviously not a great scenario. Uh, If we fast forward to the reopening, uh, it was completely different, right? So we had significant uh, fiscal stimulus pumping through the economy. We had significant monetary stimulus. Uh, The Fed was holding rates close to zero, buying a bunch of bonds. And um, we had a great fundamental economic setup too, right? Because we had... um, you know, reopening on the vac- back to the back of the vaccines. Like I said, we had the fiscal stimulus and then we had really, really easy comps. So almost any growth numbers would have looked good because you're comparing against 2020 because 2020 was so bad. So the comps were really, really easy. And so what we've seen now is really the opposite of 2021. 2021 was sort of a textbook recipe for great performance out of risk assets, right? You had easy monetary policy, uh, super supportive fiscal policy into easing comps, easing base effects. And now we have the opposite, right? So now instead of having uh, super um, easy monetary policy, we have a Fed that's committed to draining liquidity. Instead of having uh, a fiscal tailwind, we have a fiscal headwind, right? According to our work, fiscal uh, the fiscal impulse will be a drag on growth uh, through the end of 2022. And instead of comparing against the year the earth stood still, uh, right through the lockdowns, we're comparing against the reopening. So instead of comparing against minus 12.2% real G- GDP growth in Q2, we're comparing against Uh, I think it's positive 11% or something like that, some unsustainable growth number. So uh, obviously accelerating against a comp that challenging is really, really difficult. So those three things, bad fiscal, bad monetary, uh, bad comps and a bad fundamental economic setup uh, sort of explains what's happened with the market over the last six months. It's, it's, it's happened. um, You know, you never want to say it's been predictable, but you had a recipe for very bad performance from risk assets like stocks. And that's exactly what's happened. So when we think about all those comps, as you're, as you're saying, you know, like if we look at the the CPI, for example, it being a comp over last year, are we just in for for more of the same? As, and, and do you think that that is part of the reason that the Fed has taken such a hawkish stance, knowing that we're up against, you know, such low numbers to compare to? <laughs> so I think I'm, I might get flamed for saying this. Uh, I'm not and haven't been, I've been on the wrong side of the inf- <clears throat> I haven't been right on inflation since the new year, basically. Uh, we've, we've, at Invictus, our view has been that the market uh, would begin discounting slower inflation. Not, not that the comps would necessarily start to decelerate, but that the markets would be looking ahead to slower inflation by now. And we haven't really gotten evidence of that. Uh, obviously, inf- energy stocks are still outperforming uh, in relative terms. Rates have still been going up. Uh, you know, Any market-based indicator of inflation is still sort of outperforming. Our fundamental thesis for why inflation should slow is essentially that all of the inflationary tailwinds from the last couple of years are reversing, right? So like uh, you can think of inflation as 
Well, you could think of uh, inflation as a price level of goods and services, right? Mm -hmm. And so you could imagine a classic supply and demand chart. Um, when demand goes up and down, that impacts inflation. And when supply goes up and down, that also impacts inflation. And through COVID, we saw sort of a double whammy. We saw demand being goosed by uh, money printing, and we saw supply being constrained by restrictions. Our view at Invictus was that both of those things are reversing, right? Clearly, we're not getting any more money printing, right? We're not getting um, any more expansions of uh, national balance sheets. Uh, we know that will be a drag on demand, on growth over the next, at least the next six months. And we know that supply chains are improving because that's something that we track closely. So our view was going into the, uh, the base effects of the reopening, April, May, uh, June, July, with, uh, with slower growth in the money supply, with improving supply chains, it would be very natural to see uh, the year-over-year -year rate of change and inflation start to slow. And we've seen that a little bit, uh, right? You've seen core CPI and core CP PCE start to go down. Uh, you've, you've seen headline uh, PCE decelerate for at least a month. Um, and even depending on which data set you're looking at, if you're looking at the CPI's seasonally adjusted BOS number, the number for uh, May was actually three basis points slower than the number for March, despite the fact that the month over month print was 1.0%. It was a 96th, 97th percentile move in month over month terms. So you'd imagine that would, you know, in ordinary times mean accelerating year over year. But that's the power of base effects that you could have such a high monthly print and still uh, not see a new high in year over year inflation. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that was our fundamental view. Markets are not confirming that yet. Uh, generally, we like for the markets to be confirming our fundamental view before we start deploying capital or suggesting that our clients do so. Um, so anyway, that's that's been our view for inflation, and and it's more it's more or less the same. This could easily be sort of peak peak inflation, peak hawkishness. Mm -hmm. So why do you think the Fed ended up tightening a lot more than than anybody actually thought? Um, that's a good question. Why did the Fed tighten more than everyone actually thought? I think that there's maybe a little bit of confusion about how the Fed tightens. Um, I think a lot of people just look to the Fed funds rate or to the size of the Fed's balance sheet, right? You know, the, they measure the tightness of monetary conditions based on those two things. Uh, and I think that that's a little bit like looking at GDP growth to measure where we are right now. Well, it comes, it's, it's sort of a lagging indicator. Mm -hmm. uh, really the mechanism by which the Fed affects the real economy isn't through the Fed funds rate because you know, the consumer businesses don't have access to the Fed funds market. The way that um, the, the transmission mechanism through which the Fed really operates is, is something called financial conditions. Uh, and the formal definition of financial conditions are financial variables that impact the cadence of future growth. So things like the dollar uh, rates, the yield curve. And if you look at mortgage rates, right? And if you look at those types of indicators, uh, financial conditions have actually sharpened uh, pretty aggressively since the, the Fed began talking about tightening, right? So the, the bond market, the mortgage market, um, the credit market, they didn't wait for the Fed to actually start raising the Fed funds rate or running off the balance sheet. Uh, the markets are discounting mechanisms, uh, including those markets we just talked about. And so they've tightened financial conditions for the Fed. Uh, how does that happen? Well, you know, if the yield curve flattens, that makes it less attractive for spread lenders to provide capital. Uh, if the dollar becomes more expensive, that makes it um, more onerous for foreign counterparties to service their dollar-denominated obligations, whether that's buying commodities, whether that's uh, servicing euro, euro dollar debt, um, uh, credit spread, you know, credit spreads widen, or even when benchmark rates rise, that increases private sector borrowing costs, which you know eventually leads to bankruptcy. It increases the amount of money that has to go towards servicing debt and interest payments, so you're not investing as much. All of that affects aggregate demand much more than the level of the Fed funds rate itself. But it keys off of the Fed funds rate and expectations about the Fed funds rate. And the reason that this is important is, one, because it, it impacts the asset markets right away, hence the, the massive sell-offs in long-duration equities. But two, it's important to understand as an allocator because uh, if you're looking at the Fed funds rate, uh, not only would you be, you know, late to invest uh, based on tightening financial conditions, you'll be too late when they start to ease as well. So um, if you really want to understand Fed policy and how to take advantage of it as an investor, I think just generally my suggestion would be take a look at financial conditions rather than uh, you know, just reading through the minutes every once in a while or, or you know, listening to the CNBC headlines. Um, so all that to say is to say, I think financial conditions are much tighter right now um, than most people realize. And I also think that the Fed knows that. Right? The Fed knows how tightening actually works. They're not confused about it. They know when they talk about 
when they communicate with the markets about tightening, that they're actually tightening uh, through communications. It's not just about uh, it's not just about buying and selling bonds or, or Fed funds. So it's almost like their communications drive the expectation, which ends up being almost a more effective mechanism and direct mechanism on the markets rather than their actual policy decisions. Right. I would go so far as to say the the Fed's first policy tool is communications, and its second policy tool is actually toggling uh, interest rates up and down. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned GDP and, and that we saw a minus 1.4% real GDP print for the first quarter. So can you give us some context for what we are seeing for GDP growth going forward? So, yes. So uh, we've been on the slower growth. Uh, we've had, our, our thesis has been for slower real economic growth for um, for a while now. And so I would love to claim victory and say minus, you know, minus 1.4%. The truth is um, that that number, that minus 1.4% number was, is a seasonally adjusted annual rate. That's kind of the headline GDP that everyone looks at. Uh, that's not our favorite way to measure economic growth at Invictus. And uh, the reason is, is it's kind of an, an accounting convention, the way it's constructed. Uh, just, just for some background, because I think this is kind of hilarious. The way, the way it's actually created is we take GDP for the quarter. You make seasonal adjustments so that each quarter is like the others. So, for example, you would adjust out the impact of Christmas sales in Q4 because Q3 doesn't have that. Uh, and then you multiply that adjusted number by four and compare it to the prior quarter. So, obviously, the problem is uh, all these adjustments are man-made. Right, they are uh, contrivances essentially, and so the result is you get these these seasonally adjusted annual rates that don't actually reflect the business cycle. And if you try and back test against these SARS, it's very very hard to get a clean, intuitive back test. Nothing really makes sense. It's just not an accurate reflection of the business cycle. So, like directionally at Invictus, we agree that growth is slowing. Uh, the one the minus one point four percent is probably. Um, not a totally accurate representation. We prefer to look at the year-over-year rate of change uh, of the different economic statistics. So in year-over-year terms, uh, GDP was 3.5% in Q1. And so uh, the way we think about that is, look, 3.5% isn't bad. 3.5% is still above trend, right? We think trend, long-term trend potential growth in GDP is probably around 2%. So uh, 150 basis points above trend, that's not bad at all, right? You know, Maybe the market should be higher. Mm-hmm. But the truth is, um, it doesn't really matter what the number is relative to trend. What matters is where it's going, right? And our expectation is that growth continues to slow uh, with fiscal drag, as, t- as financial conditions tighten, as base effects continue to be challenging. Um, and so that, that remains our thesis for the time being. We don't have an exact stop point where we expect growth to sort of reverse and start accelerating again, but uh, not to be a downer. We think it could be a while. Mm-hmm. And, you know, as we're thinking about let's say, a better way to get a sense of the, the real GDP and, and where it's actually heading. That makes me wonder how accurate you think the CPI number is, considering that there's all these adjustments that they've made throughout the years. You know, Even if we look at core CPI, well, how does core CPI minus, I, I believe it's minus food and energy. Is that, is that right? Right. So right. how, like, how is that at all a reasonable metric to try to measure inflation for the average person? Uh, yeah, I think that's true. I think there are all kinds of problems with the way the CPI is calculated. I mean, for one, it's the CPI that everyone references is uh, actually the CPI for urban consumers, which is obviously not everyone. And, you know, it's, it's an average. So it, it doesn't, ref, it, it, you know, it reflects something very specific. You know, is it, is it, is it that accurate even for that group? This is what I'll say. I think what the CPI does accurately capture is the rate of change in inflation. And ultimately, for decision-making purposes, um, that's what we care about at Invictus because that's what drives the performance of inflationary assets mm-hmm. uh, like energy stocks or commodities or um, whatever, you know, tip, tips, tips relative to treasuries. So, um, you know, is CPI, you know, you, you could say it is. I know that the MIT did the study which showed that the CPI is actually an accurate gauge of inflation. Uh, do I trust their work? I don't know. I haven't. I haven't gone through it. But um, honestly, from the perspective of an investor, what I really care about is that is that rate of change thing. As long as the CPI, as long as I believe the CPI and the PCE and all these various measures of inflation are accurately capturing the turning points, mm-hmm. um, that's really what I'm focused on. So you know, you 
take together a bunch of different points of data here. So how do you use the, the CRB commodity index as a tool and, and what can you use it to predict? So I think the CRB, first of all, the CRB commodity index is a basket of commodities. So, you know, oil, different base metals, different agricultural commodities, sort of like the S&P 500, but instead of for stocks, it's for commodities. And the reason that we look at it in particular is it's just the most liquid um, constituent of inflation. So uh, if there's going to be a big inflationary shock or disinflationary shock, think COVID, right? Uh, which driver of inflation is going to react first? Is it going to be your rent, which is a huge driver of inflation? It's you know, 30, 30% of CPI, and uh, I think it's more than that for PCE. Or is it going to be you know, the price of freely traded commodities on a, in a super liquid exchange? Well, you're going to see it in commodities first. And so uh, that's what we pay attention to. And actually, if you, if you take a graph of the year over year rate of change of commodities or the CRB commodity index and mm-hmm. uh, overlay it on the CPI, it's very, very close. And that's one of the reasons that we know the CPI does, does capture the turning points, right? Uh, you know, CPI inflation isn't exactly the same as commodity inflation, but their cadence should be pretty similar um, over, over, you know, call it a month or two or three. Mm-hmm. And uh, so anyway, that, that's, that's essentially how we use uh, the commodity. And you can break it down into ags and base metals and energy, and they all mean precious metals, of course, and they all sort of mean something a little bit different. Um, you know, if you broke the energy tends to have a closer relationship with inflation, base metals tend to be a little bit more related to real growth. Uh, obviously, precious metals are much more defensive than the rest of commodities. Um, but that's essentially how we use the CRB index itself. Mm-hmm. And, and you also mentioned bellwethers earlier. So is that is that just another data point that you put in your in your analysis to get a, a real picture of where we're headed and not just looking at the official numbers? Yeah, so bellwether analysis. I think bellwether analysis is probably like one of the oldest uh, tools that that market strategists have used to try and keep their finger on the pulse of the economy, especially maybe when economic data wasn't as good. Um, but essentially, the idea is uh, you can imagine a bellwether used to be the, the sheep that led a flock, or is the the sheep at the front of the flock, and it wore a bell, and so the shepherd knew where the flock was going because he could listen for the bell. And so the idea is there are certain companies that are so important to the economy, they just have so many touch points in the real economy that you can look at the performance of those stocks and it will tell you something about what's going on underneath, right, in the underlying economy. And um, so we track certain bellwethers. You could think of Amazon as a good one for consumers, right, or -hmm. or Caterpillar as a bellwether for industrial activity. And uh, we follow these names basically for that purpose, right, to make sure that they're not signaling something to us that contradicts our thesis. So right now, our thesis is for slower real growth, right? If we saw Caterpillar, you know, go up 15% next month and make a new high, we would have to think really seriously about that slower real growth thesis because Caterpillar is saying, hey, <laughs> this stock, which is a huge liquid stock and, and generally tracks economic activity pretty closely, uh, is telling you you're wrong. So that's something we'd have to pay attention to. And just as a fun fact, if you look at a, a chart of the price of Caterpillar and the price of copper, uh, it's amazing how similar they are. They're, they're very, very close. And that's because they're reflecting the same underlying demand dynamics, right? Industrial activity. Mm-hmm. So which one lags the other? Does does the Caterpillar price lag the copper price? Well, off the top of my head, I'd say generally I find that equities tend to be um, a little bit more forward-looking than commodities, probably because there's more speculation in the equity market. Mm-hmm. In the commodity market, there's commercial hedgers and, and people that are buying copper for you know, industrial use over the next you know month or so, and, and stocks can afford to be a little bit more forward-looking than that. Interesting. So we talked about CPI quite a bit there, and on Friday we hit eight point six percent. So why does everyone but the Fed pay attention to this number, as you as you talked about in your latest daily update video? Well, that was kind of said tongue in cheek. I think the Fed does pay attention to CPI. They tend to anchor a little bit more to the PCE number, and. Uh, <laughs> a cynic might say because PCE tends to just be lower. Um, look, the, the Fed is run by a lot of academics, right? And the academic data shows that the CPI actually tends to overstate inflation a little bit. I don't know if that's something that I, I personally believe. Uh, I would just, again, point to the fact that the PCE and the CPI in, in rate of change terms tend to track each other extremely closely. Mm-hmm. And uh, in terms of policy implications, we spend less time trying to like slice and dice the PCE and the CPI in really nuanced ways, because there are a million Fed watchers that used to work at the Fed and understand the internal politics better and 
you know, CIA investigative journalism, they, they, they can read their body language. And that's not really our game at Invictus. Uh, when we're assessing uh, our expectations about policy, we're almost always looking at um, the bond market, the different measures of yield curvature, the different measures of financial conditions, the currency markets, because that's really where our analytical edge uh, lies. <laughs> so it's less time on um, really slicing and dicing that, that inflation data, even though you know, there, there probably is signal there. It's just not where we can leverage our conviction. So, Mike, another thing that you had touched on, you know, as let's say the bellwether of Amazon being a good marker for consumer sentiment right now, how healthy is the average American consumer and, and why is the consumer index a very misleading piece of data? That's a great question. And uh, it's it's funny because I think that is the most prolific meme in the mainstream financial media right now that the consumer is strong, right? You hear Fed officials saying it, you hear pundits on CNBC saying it, you hear professional research providers saying it. And um, there are a lot of reasons to think it's not right. The first, Amazon is one reason that the performance of Amazon stock has been very, very poor. And obviously Amazon has a lot of touch points with the consumer. Um, generally, if you look at consumer discretionary as a sector, it's done very, very poorly. It's been one of the worst performing sectors um, just in the stock universe. If you look at retail stock specifically, they've gotten crushed. They're down 35 or 40%. So I think uh, if you are in the camp that the consumer is rock solid and super strong, I think you have to answer why the stocks that should benefit most from a strong consumer are underperforming the worst. Mm -hmm. uh, on top of that, I would, I would also note that consumer sentiment is at recessionary levels. I think this is widely known, but I think it's important to bring it up because you have to ask yourself, right? Uh, if consumers were in such good shape, then, then why are they saying they're in such bad shape? And I think this is kind of a classic, I was telling you this before, a classic example of where the experts uh, and the people on the ground disagree, right? The experts are all saying, oh, the consumer's in great shape. The consumer balance sheet's never been better. Excess savings are off the charts. Um, and consumers are saying about their own financial situation, hey, this isn't good at all. You know, I'm upset about something. And uh, you know, at Invictus, we're inclined to trust the market, and we're trying, and we're inclined to trust the consumer, and not the uh, the data manipulation that you see on Wall Street. Mm -hmm. So, if we tie that to the U.S. labor market being in a in a very fragile place at the moment, would an imminent recession cause long term damage to that labor market? Yes. So, I think I think that's something that's often overlooked uh, when people are assessing the health of the labor market. They're frequently looking at Unemployment, right? That's the certainly the headline number uh, whenever you get new employment data. And um, the reality is, when you have a recession, uh, the only casualty isn't that headline U3 unemployment data. In our opinion at Invictus, uh, the real casualty is labor force participation. If you dig beneath the surface, that's been one of the biggest problems in America and just developed market economies around the world. Is labor force participation has been on the decline for 15 or 20 years, and every time there's a recession or a growth shock. Uh, labor force participation goes down, and it takes a very long time to induce people to come back into the labor force, or they don't come back at all. Uh, we're still missing about a million workers from pre-COVID, right, uh, who just don't want to come back. And I don't know what their explanations are, but it's very consistent with historical growth shocks and recessions, right, and spikes in unemployment. And so if the Fed is forced to induce another recession to deal with inflation now, that would further reduce, that would very likely further reduce labor force participation. And the reason we care about that is because long-term potential trend growth for any economy is really just a function of two things, growth in the labor force and labor force productivity. And obviously labor force participation uh, relates to that first variable. If you have a slower growing labor force or people just aren't working anymore, your economy can't grow as fast. And obviously growth is a staple, a staple of our business cycle analysis. Slower growth over the long-term means worse performance from uh, risk assets, particularly stocks. Mm -hmm. So when we think about the, the main tool that the Fed has to combat inflation by you know, adjusting rates and running off their balance sheet, do they have the same effectiveness when the debt level is so much higher now? And where might that breaking point exist considering the absolute debt level now? So I think, I think you could make the case that uh, the Fed's tools are actually more effective with higher debt. Um, because what the Fed tries to do when it tightens financial conditions is slow demand. And um, 
when you have when you have more debt, that that simple tool of raising interest rates becomes more effective. I mean, think about if you have a bunch of credit card debt, right? And the interest rate on that debt is variable for whatever reason. Um, the higher interest rates go, uh, the more onerous that credit card debt is for you. The more you have to cut back on consumption of other stuff or investment. And the U.S. economy is different from the consumer balance sheet in various ways. But in that sense, it is kind of similar, right? The higher interest rates, higher interest rates matter more to the extent there is higher debt. Um, in terms of where we should see rates reverse, our expectation on Invictus was that the 2018 levels would be a very logical place to see rates tread water. It looks like um, certain important rates in the belly have already broken out above 2018. And I don't know when this comes out, but maybe the rest of the curve will break out as well. Um, but that 2018 level was really important. There, I think it's our view at Invictus that rates above 2018 levels, there's no way those aren't above neutral. There's no way those rates aren't restrictive of economic growth. And uh, it doesn't mean they can't go higher. It just means that the uh, collateral damage in terms of the economy will be more significant, right? So the odds of a soft landing go down, so to speak. And, you know, Mike, you've said before that if investors are are trying to take everything into account, that they would be, you know, kind of silly not to be looking at the bond market as it is one of the most forward and, and sensitive looking markets that you can take into account. So what would the bond market starting to price in easing financial conditions look like? So um, there are a handful of things that you could look at. The, probably the first, the first would be rates stop going up so fast. <laughs> so when rates are going up really quickly, that's generally symptomatic of a Fed that's tightening financial conditions. Um, if you want to get ahead of just rates going, going down, you can also look at different measures of yield curvature. So typically what you would expect to see is if you're looking at something like the twos tens or the fives thirties, instead of a bear flattening, what you'd expect to see is what's called a bear steepening, um, where the long rate starts to go down, right? Where the long end starts to catch a bit. And generally what that would translate to in economic terms is expectations for slower growth. So the bond market would be signaling, look, you've tightened policy quite a bit. And uh, now you're starting to affect the bond market's growth outlook. You could also look at the front end of the curve. You could look at shorter term measures of curvature, like say the three month, one year, or the three month, two year. And uh, the front end of the yield curve generally corresponds to expectations about the Fed's policy path. So if the Fed is going to be more hawkish, you'd expect those measures of curvature to start going up. And if it's going to be less hawkish, you'd expect to see them start going down. That would correspond to roughly the number of rate hikes in the out months, you know, past three months. And um, frankly, the Fed tends to communicate its views on rates pretty explicitly. So most of the tightening monetary conditions happens in the out months, um, which is to say uh, tracking those short-term measures of curvature is a good way to get ahead of uh, what the Fed will actually do next and what will get priced into the larger bond market next. Mm -hmm. So are credit spreads telling us that a recession is the most likely outcome for the rest of the year? I've got to say, I found credit spreads rather mystifying. Uh, they are going up. But I would have expected them to be going up a lot more, given how aggressively the Fed has tightened and the fact that growth was going to decelerate pretty aggressively regardless, because we just obviously cannot sustain reopening level growth after the reopening. We don't have the demographics for it or the productivity dynamics for it. Um, I, I honestly don't know what's going up with credit going on with credit spreads. They have gone up. They are indicating that they're discounting a little bit more stress, but nothing, nothing like the sell-off in stocks would make you make you believe, or the the sell-off in treasuries. Uh, you know, high yield bonds have, you know, if you look back over most periods of time, high yield bonds are still outperforming treasuries. That's not characteristic of a high stress uh, environment in the financial system. So I don't have a terrific explanation for that. If the Fed is going to induce a growth scare, induce a recession, you would almost certainly expect to see credit spreads widen much more aggressively. Mm -hmm. So how do you define the term recession, Mike? And do most investors use this term too much? <laughs> That's a good question. I think I've used it like 10 times now, so <laughs> I'm, I'm breaking my own rule. Uh, <laughs> I would just point out the irony that most investors, including myself, don't know what a recession is. And uh, people, people use it all the time and they say, oh, it's you know two, two quarters of declining uh, growth or, or of negative GDP growth. And that's actually not right. A recession is uh, always defined after the fact by a government agent agency called the National Bureau of Economic Research. And so my suggestion uh, to most investors would be rather than try trying to trade the headlines or um, 
you know, whatever you think about a recession, it's better to just trade the growth cycle because if growth declines for long enough, you're going to get a recession, even if the specific criteria about employment and income aren't known uh, with precision. So trading the growth cycle, you'll get recessions right, and you don't have to worry about uh, however the NDER decides to uh, define a, re- a recession specifically. Mm-hmm. So does this entire declining growth story mean that many of the demand forces that we have seen drive up commodity prices will come off? And could we see some of these commodity prices come off their recent highs as well? Well, that, that's the whole tightening financial conditions thesis is that um, you know the, the, the price of commodities, like the price of anything, is set by supply and demand. The Fed thinks it can reduce demand by tightening financial conditions. That tends to happen on a lag, right? The old saying is that uh, the Fed works through long and variable lags. And eventually that'll hit commodity prices. Um, when that happens, it's really hard to tell, right? Stagflation becomes deflation really, really quickly. And there's not always a ton of warning signs. I mean, you can look at the price of oil from 2008 as an example. Uh, there weren't that many technical indicators for the way oil sold off before that happened. And ironically, if you look at a lot of the headlines from then and the headlines from now, they look very similar, right? Well, you know, uh, more regulation for oil and gas companies, uh, prices at the, at the gas stations are, you know, all-time highs, stuff like that. Um, I will say recessions are almost categorically deflationary events, just because when you see growth contract really sharply, um, you generally don't see the price of things go up because that, that demand side of the equation is going down. So um, yeah, our expectation is for slower growth. Eventually that makes its way to the price of commodities and we think commodity prices do come down. It doesn't have to be a, you know, a 2008 style deflation, mm-hmm. but I don't think that's off the table either. So Mike, what economic backdrop would be the best for gold? So historically, the best economic backdrop for gold has been uh, slower real growth and high inflation, which is incidentally what we're seeing right now. So first, I would say gold hasn't done that badly, right, relative to everything else. You know, maybe it's been relatively flat, but there are tons of investors that would be very happy to be relatively flat this year. All right, this has been um, an extraordinary challenging uh, market for a lot of investors, particularly hedge funds. So it's it's easy to get you know discouraged because gold hasn't gone to three thousand yet, but uh, holding holding flat uh, in this environment is still pretty darn good. Mm-hmm. I would say the thing that's holding gold back right now, I think the reason that you haven't seen it um, really outperform in absolute terms is uh, monetary conditions are tightening. Right, the Fed is raising rates, and essentially gold is um, an asset that competes with the dollar, that competes with um, treasuries for incremental cash from investors, right? And so when the yield on treasuries goes up, you know, the, the marginal buyer says, huh, should I buy, you know, gold with, you know, zero yield or should I buy treasuries with three and a half percent yield or whatever? And treasuries get more attractive on the margin relative to gold. So uh, for gold to really take off, you'd like to see easing monetary conditions. You'd like to see rates start to come down. Um, when does that happen? Well, we're watching closely. Obviously, it hasn't happened exactly yet. but um, Eventually, it does, right? Eventually, when financial conditions tighten to the point that uh, it starts to impact growth in a way that investors and real people and Fed officials can see, um, they'll you know they'll they'll turn back <laughs> they'll turn back to easy, relatively easy monetary policy pretty quickly, and gold would be a beneficiary of that, a substantial beneficiary. So, do you think that there are any other drivers for the price of gold that we didn't really mention, or that that you can think of? You know, maybe once we see these financial conditions start to loosen off a little bit? None that come to mind off the top of my head. The three things that we really track closely are growth, inflation, and monetary conditions. And gold usually trades uh, trades with those things pretty closely. Mm-hmm. Perfect. Awesome, Mike. Well, I really appreciate your time today. Is there anything else you think there's worth mentioning before we wrap up here? Um, no, nothing that, nothing that comes to mind off the top of my head about the economy. I thought that was... Uh, that was a pretty comprehensive overview of what's going on. Absolutely, it was. Um, for anybody that's interested, of course, your research is available at invictus-research.com. Tell us a little bit about the different kinds of products that you put a lot of work into there. Yeah, of course. So uh, I think really that the idea for Invictus is a replacement for the business section of the newspaper. Uh, I think a lot of people, when they start in investing, uh, they get told by their bosses that they should start their day by reading the business section of the journal, by reading Bloomberg, uh, 
And the reason their bosses tell them that is because that's what they do and that's what their bosses told them. And it's just a, a long tradition, uh, you know, going back to the beginning of Benjamin Graham that everyone reads the newspapers. Um, but I think the reality is business news today is really just entertainment news in a suit. And most investors would be far better served by spending five or 10 minutes each morning consuming something more like Invictus, where you uh, try to understand where you are in the business cycle, what the implications are for forward returns in the different asset classes, and uh, coming away with something that's uh, actually useful and investable in terms of asset allocation and investment decision making, rather than uh, you know what the breakup fee is on Elon Musk's deal with Twitter or something like that. And uh, we try and do it at an affordable retail, affordable price point. We sell um, a daily update. We sell um, weekly trade ideas and a longer term monthly product. And it starts at under $60 a month. Excellent. And of course, you're available on Twitter as well at Invictus Macro. Mike, yes, thanks so much for right. your time today. All right. Thank you, Tom. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.